excited because we have three guests from the Academy of Natural Sciences. Um, we have Paul Kalaman. I hope I get your titles right. Collections Manager 3, Molecology. He's going to teach us how to pronounce that correctly. We have Kelsey Ann uh, Monahan Phelan. Did I get it right? A special collections librarian and Jennifer Vass, who's an archivist. And they're here today to tell us a little bit about their work and a little bit about the Academy. So thank you so much. We're so happy to hear from you. Uh, talk for a little bit. And then if you guys have questions, hopefully we'll have some time to answer questions. So Paul, who has KP duty, go for it. All right. So I'm, I'm talking to you here by a combination of technology. So you're actually hearing me through my phone, not if you can hear me. Right. OK, good. So you can hear me through my phone, but I'm going to be sharing my screen on my computer. Don't ask. It's just, this is just all like incredibly technological. Here we go. So can you see a picture here of lots of drawers and two people? You can, good, all right. Let's see if I can get it to actually behave like a slideshow. There we go. Okay, so here's where I work. This is the mollusk collection of the Academy of Natural Sciences. What you're looking at here is uh, two uh, rows of uh, 30 rows of these drawers. We have 16,000 of these drawers. And as you can see in each drawer, there's a whole bunch of shells. And this is the world's, depending on who you talk to, this is the world's third or fourth largest shell collection, not in the United States, but in the world. And tied up with the shells in their drawers is an awful lot of information. And the reason we have these enormous collections that are organized systematically, that is to say, all of the members of one species are together, and they are all grouped together in a genus, which is a group of species we think are more closely related to each other than they are to others and so on and so on. The reason we do this is to try and make sense of nature. Um, nature keeps no records and nature has no organization. These are both things that we need for our own purposes, chiefly nowadays to, to try and get some idea of how extensively we're screwing up the planet. So in these drawers, we see specimens, that are arranged uh, very in a very orderly way. And we see labels that were written uh, in some cases 120 years ago, long before there was any idea of information technology. So if you wanted to see the specimens, you had to come to the academy. And if you wanted to know what was on the labels, you had to write to us and we would tell you. These days, all of this is on the internet. We have scanned and uh, we have transcribed all of the handwritten labels and we maintain a large and elaborate database and regularly update, uh, upload it to the internet where it sits. Uh, let's have a look here. Here we go. So this is what it looks like if you search our collection on the internet. So for each of the specimens, there is a set of photographs and there is information about when and where it was collected and who collected it and what we think it is. And uh, if you zoom in on the pictures, you can actually, uh, there's a little slide zoomer, so you can look at all the details. And with any luck, you don't, you then don't have to borrow the specimen from us because we've put enough data on the internet that you can tell what it is you're looking at. The, uh, this requires a lot of imaging. So we have a big imaging center and we have co-ops. Those are two co-ops there. Both of them are still employed by us years after their co-op ended because doing this kind of thing is just so fascinating and we pay such high salaries that they couldn't drag themselves away. And uh, samples here of the, of the photographs they take, that one in the middle, uh, that's 1.9 millimeters long, which means it's not even as long as a grain of rice. And each of those pictures is a 48 image tiled comp composite of pictures taken with a scanning electron microscope. And that's all done in our department. So, Data gives specimens meaning. What that means is that all the questions we want to ask about how the world is changing can only be replied by, by be answered using some sort of material evidence. So these shells here, these are Japanese land snails. They've been collected over a long period. The one with the red dot on it is the actual specimen that was used to describe the species right at the beginning. And then after it come about two dozen examples taken at different times in different places in Japan. 
the reason that these are really important these days, apart from the from being representatives of their species and apart from the type being the only unimpeachable representative of its species, the one that all the others must look like, is that nature keeps no records. So you can see the shells on the right are actually beginning to dissolve. Once snails die, their shells dissolve very quickly. Within a year or so, they're gone. And these specimens preserve not only a record of the species, the earliest ones were taken before the Japanese started using pesticides, then some of them are from before Hiroshima, and some of them are from before the Fukushima meltdown. And they've all been in the United States since before those events happened. So if you want to know what the natural isotope loading of the Japanese countryside is, you have to come to our collection because all the collections in Japan have been irradiated. So the key understanding here is that we have no idea when we collect things, how they will be significant in the future, but we have a, an absolutely cast iron faith that the longer we keep them, the more meaningful they'll become. And we've been born out in that faith since we started. So we create a stable environment. These are cabinets which we designed ourselves to be uh, the optimum space efficiency, but also uh, inert materials. So these are all made of metal and all the card products we use are buffered and we monitor acidity inside the cabinets and we monitor the, uh, the environment of the room and so on in order to try and be confident that these things will still be here in 500 years time which is roughly the time frame that we collection managers think in. So there's a little bit about what this collection looks like, uh, what it's for, and uh, I'm happy to uh, take questions. Wow, fascinating, okay. Um, let's see, people have questions. You can just unmute yourselves and ask them, I think. Well, I have a question. Um, do you guys actively actively collect, or is the collection mainly built upon donations and gifts? We don't have much of a field program at the moment, but in the average year, we will receive between ten and twenty thousand specimens, and this is mostly from collections from people who have collected all their lives and who now want the uh, want all this effort to uh, go to a museum. Uh, there are collections that we track, so we know the collectors, we know that they are scientifically very sound and that they're building priceless collections. And so we maintain relationships with these people so that when the time comes, we get their collection. And we know that within the next 10 years, we probably have between two and 500,000 lots inbound that are already promised to us. So I do have a question. Um, I'm curious, do you also have specimens from after Fukushima or Hiroshima? Any of anything like that? Do you have you so you can compare before and after? So one of the great movements of our time of the last 15 to 20 years has been the amalgamation of various museum collections. So we are part of what are called themed collection networks, TCNs, which are sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And under these networks, natural history collections all over the world pool their data. So we may not have, for example, a post Fukushima specimen, but we can tell you who has. And so we never used to be able to do that. But now that most major natural history collections are putting their catalogs online and those catalogs are being aggregated, it's possible to go to a site like iDigBio, for example, or um, GBIF, type in a species name and get records, museum records from all over the world of collections that have it, when it was collected, where it was collected and so on. So if you are conducting that kind of study where you need examples of a species collected over time and space, now instead of writing letters to museums and asking if they have them, you can just go on the internet and find out whether they have them. This is getting us closer to the, uh, the Victorian ideal of the Universal Museum. The Universal Museum is the concept that eventually there will be one of everything in a museum somewhere. 
and it won't matter where it is because they'll be universally available. Jen likes that. She likes anything associated with Victorians. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm curious about the people who work in, I'm still not sure if I'm saying it right, Malacology? Um, oh. What kind of backgrounds do you have and what are some of the different jobs that people do other than collection manager? Well, as in most branches of science, there's a strong division between the gentlemen and the players. So this is a Victorian concept. There you go. The, uh, the professional scientists, the ones who have PhDs, the ones who went on a science track very early in their careers, who are now professors and uh, have their own laboratories and their own research programs and so on. Um, they are in a different level to the people who run the collections. So the people who run the collections are people like me. They have practical skills, they have material knowledge. Uh, they tend to have some good knowledge of the taxon itself, of the particular group that that collection uh, represents. So if you're, if you're in charge of an entomology collection, it helps to know about insects. But the center of gravity of your world is not research. So the, the, the professors, they are researchers and they're expected to produce original research in science. The collections managers are not under any pressure to do that. They can do that, and you know, now and again, we'll describe new species or we'll write papers, but it's not the main focus of our job. The main focus of our job is that we are a combination of managers and conservators, and we serve. So we serve the scientific community, we serve the institution, and we serve the public at large. So it's like officers and NCOs in the military. You know, the officers go to officer school and, and uh, very early on, they exist in a different world. The NCOs never rise above master sergeant, but a sensible officer has a good relationship with his master sergeants because otherwise he's not gonna get much done. Interesting. Let's see, um, other questions for Paul before he goes to peel potatoes? I'm just assuming that's your KP duty. <laughs> I'm really curious that the scale of this is kind of like insane to me. How long does it take and how much staff does it take to organize a donation and catalog it and create metadata for it? Like how, what is the, how long is that process? So it depends to a great extent on how much cataloging the original collector did. So for example, we brought in a collection of uh, seabed samples from off South Carolina that whose owner had spent 10 years labeling and identifying and labeling them. And that was so easy to work with because most of the work had been done that with that collection, I have one co-op working on it and within her six month co-op, she'll catalog probably 8,000 lots. Then we have other collections that come in where the labels are handwritten or they're on three by five cards. There's absolutely no computerization and it's a craft project. Each of each record is unique and you have to transcribe them and that can take forever. There's a sort of law of diminishing return sets it. So in, a, in the case of a collection like that, we will cherry pick the stuff that we know we need for our collection. And then a lot of it will end up in the free shells for kids buckets or will just disappear mysteriously. To, but knowing what, what, you know, knowing what to keep, looking at, looking at someone's collection and saying, oh yeah, we want those, but we don't want those that requires a deep knowledge of your own collection. And so one of the things about being a collection manager is that the longer you do it, the better you get at it. To what extent um, in the collections you receive is the classification other people have done correct? Well, classification is an opinion. So species are an opinion, genera are an opinion, families are an opinion, and it's always changing. So there are online uh, aggregates of the current state of the art, uh, particularly regarding invertebrates. And so we will tend to upgrade our classification to match that wherever possible, but we can't upgrade the classification of 500,000 lots every week. So inevitably certain sections of our collection will be out of date taxonomically. And every now and again, when I'm feeling bored, I'll take a cabinet and I'll completely redo the taxonomy and then update the uh, 
database and that will get us up to date for that particular family for this particular year. But yeah, we're always playing catch up because, you know, people are always reclassifying things. You have to remember, there is no such thing as a species. These things are just opinion. That's pretty mind blowing to someone like me who really doesn't work at all in the biological sciences. Kind of pulling the rug out from under our confidence there, in science. It's interesting. Well, you know, it's like Woody Allen said, I've never been an intellectual, but I have this look. <laughs> it's uh, I went to art school. Um, my first degree is in design, three dimensional design for wood, metal and plastics. Um, my other two degrees, one is in the philosophy of science, science, technology and society from Drexel, and the other is in museum leadership from Drexel. I have no qualifications in biology or, uh, or you know, systematic science at all. You don't need it. This is storekeeping. It's storekeeping on a heroic level, but it's storekeeping. I was just reading a piece today by Latour, who's suggesting that all science is constructed and what you're saying really, really fits into this piece that I was reading. I will lean forward and just for the benefit of your students. Mm, where's my camera? There we go. Oh, it was a much yes. shorter version that I read, but yeah. Science in Action by Bruno Latour. Mm -hmm. You only read one book on philosophy of science. That's the one. Um, there's also uh, Latour and Woolgar's Laboratory Life, which is about how facts get made, how laboratories are factories in which facts get created, and there is a relationship between facts and the truth, and they are not the same thing. And then if you're really feeling like a serious read and you are not scared easily, I would also recommend, just because I happen to have some students in front of me, I would also recommend this book. The Climate of History in a Planetary Age by Chakrabarti. It's just come out. If you only read one book on climate change, this should be it. And it will scare the living daylights out of you, but it is a, a fantastic primer in the literature of, uh, of uh, climate change and the philosophy behind the various approaches people are taking to a problem that humans by definition, probably won't be able to solve. So sorry about that. I went off topic a bit there. But you mentioned Latour. He's a, he's someone I read a lot. So we love that kind of thing. Well, if Latour doesn't frighten you, of course, then uh, this fellow will. Uh, if you're interested in collection management, if you're interested in museum collections, here's Foucault's The Order of Things about how we name things and how we classify things and how classification is a human instinct and how it's usually wrong. <laughs> Foucault has written on a lot of things and uh, well, it's difficult stuff, but that book is fairly accessible. It's fairly good fun. So I have no life, there's my bookshelf. <laughs> So how did you particularly end up in this area? If you said your background is in studio design, the museum leadership part certainly makes sense, but how did you end up in this, in this career? So there's, there's a light that goes on. Um, when I was very small, I, was, I, I started to collect shells and I don't know why, and I still don't know why, but the first time I saw a shell, a seashell, a light went on and it's never gone out. And the, you can analyze it all you like. You can be as, as kind of cold about it as you want, but there's no explanation for it. And this is very, this is very important. So we have people who come and work in the department and some of them are very nice, normal people who have a certain amount of interest in what we do and they do a good job. And then they go on and do something else. And then now and again, we'll get one in whom the light has gone on. And they will stay in this field forever, come what may. Um, now and again, you'll get the happy combination of somebody in whom the light is on and who also has some sort of grip on real life. Those things don't always come together. And uh, it's a rare and wonderful combination when you find it. And 
there's not that many of us and we tend to know each other. It's a kind of small community. There are probably 50 professional malacologists in the world and I know all of them because it is that combination. And you'll find this with entomologists, you'll find this with ichthyologists, you'll find this with anybody for whom some kind of creepy crawly is actually more important than humans. Wow. Um, any other questions from anybody? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I learned quite a lot and I've written down a couple of book titles I'll venture into. Thank you so much. Enjoy cleaning up from dinner. All right. Thank you. <laughs>
also in a lot of cases, you don't want to move because you've built a collection yourself um, and you're keeping it here. So what I do on a daily basis, I'm what is referred to as a loan arranger. So I am the only archivist at the Academy, uh, which means that I do both processing as well as reference work. And I'm actually going to share my screen right now, hoping that it works, because I'm going to show you if I can. Hold on. Uh, um, hmm, so all windows. Sorry, I apparently have a lot of stuff open on my desktop. Yeah. Oh, here we go. All right. So, all right. So, what you're seeing is archive space, which is the database that we use. This is the back end. So, this is where all of my work happens. We also do have a public user interface. And actually, we share this with the other Drexel archives. Um, up until about two years ago, we were all using uh, Archivist Toolkit, uh, which was very prominent in many collections. Uh, it was one of the go-tos, but it was no longer being supported. So we joined together. Uh, we each have our own instance, but as you can see, we kind of switch between, we can switch between them. Um, this is really, it, it's been really great because I've, I've be, been able to build stronger relationships with the other archives at Drexel um, as we're working through our, our databases. And actually, whereas you get here, you can only see my collections, um, but having this database where all of us are part of it, you can actually, we actually share agents. So all of the agents are the, are in this case, names of the people in our collections. Um, we share those. <laughs> so it's all of the Drexel archives names. Um, and we have found that we do have some overlap um, between the medical college and me or us and, and the university archives. Uh, so this is where a lot of my work happens. Uh, I process collections, I create um, finding aids or have other people create finding aids. I've had co-ops, some of them, um, and interns, and I did have an assistant archivist for a while. Um, and so on the back end, you know, I can jump in and this is, this is a very small collection. <laughs> so there's not much information. I would say probably a good 75% of our collections, I have of that 2,500 linear feet, um, probably a, a, a we, I have 1,010 separate collections. Really, it's probably closer to 900 because of weird numbering from our past um, that we're trying to work out. Uh, but so you have something like this. This is a collection that only has, uh, I think, two folders in it. That's the entire collection versus you come to our biggest single collection. Um, which is the Ruth Patrick Papers, and that currently is 156 boxes, about 150 linear feet. And then I have 300 more linear feet of her materials waiting to be processed. Uh, my first major task when I came to the Academy eight years ago was to clear out Ruth Patrick's office. Ruth Patrick uh, was a leader in um, environmental studies. Uh, she was an expert on diatoms, little microscopic algae in the water. She was part of developing the Clean Water Act um, and the Patrick Center at the Academy, which does environmental studies uh, from the Delaware watershed, is named after her. And she died two months before I started, eight years ago. She was 104 years old and she had never really severed her connection to the Academy. So she had a big office with a lot of stuff. <laughs> Uh, and one of the tasks is, it took me two years to clear out her office, bring all those materials down, and now the next step is getting that 300 linear feet processed. Um, that'll be about another two-year project when, when we can get there. So uh, my day-to-day -day is processing archives or responding to research requests. We had a lot, obviously, at this point distance, but we are having a lot more people come in um, and do research in-house. Our scientists are among our biggest users, but we also get 
researchers from outside, a lot of historians. Uh, we're working with a lot of students right now from Drexel. And uh, we've had an array of, of people from people looking for inspiration for their tattoos to people who are writing plays. Um, very occasionally genealogy that almost never happens uh, at the academy, but sometimes we do have genealogy as well. So this is the discoverability side of the archives. My entire reason for being is to make collections discoverable so that people know that we have it and can find it uh, and we can pull it for them. One of the other big things that I do and have been doing uh, is digitization. So Paul showed you some pictures, I'm gonna share again of uh, some of the imaging that he's done. And I'm gonna show you some of the ones that I've done. So, you know, with 2,500 linear feet, uh, that's a lot of papers. And I've got, I think a total of about 4,000, or excuse me, 40,000 individual images that have been scanned since 2003. <laughs> so, <laughs> Not a lot uh, when we're looking at probably millions of pieces of paper. But in the last three or four years, I've focused on uh, one type of material in particular, and that is our field journals. So our field journals are the documentation of our expeditions and the collecting of specimens that we have in the other departments. These are gonna be really useful for our scientists to enhance their catalog records. Uh, we had a um, pilot project where one of our scientists actually digitized field journals, put them on this site, which is called Biodiversity Heritage Library. And then uh, he's actually linking the catalog record for the specimens to the page, the image of the page, where the collection of that specimen is described. So this is the beginning of what is kind of a hot topic right now in the world of uh, science museums and collections, which is called the extended specimen. So you've got the specimen and now you want every piece of context that is related to that. And part of that is the field journals. These are also potentially going to be uh, really useful for climate study. So I have the uh, garden diaries of William Bartram from 1802 to 1822. Uh, Gar Bartram's garden still exists and these are an almost day-to-day -day record of what he's seeing over the year when plants are being, when plants are sprouting, when the first frost happens, when birds are migrating. And so scientists can look back at that and kind of compare that same area 200 years later. And there's also the potential for a lot of uh, social cultural investigations. A lot of our scientists were traveling around the world and they were traveling in areas like Africa, which were colonized at the time that they were going there. A lot of our expeditions were made possible because of colonization and the expansion of the United States. So there's a lot of potential in there for what we're looking at in terms of decolonizing the collections, finding the voices of those whose lands we were taking advantage of. Um, and so Biodiversity Heritage Library is a really amazing site. Um, it's actually really strongly related to uh, Kelsey's collection, our rare book collection. It was established specifically for rare books on natural history. Museums, special libraries around the world are digitizing their rare books, putting them online. And a few years ago, we started digitizing our field journals as well. So this is really great because it's the only place that I really have the ability right now to put the materials that I digitize. I have a lot of other materials digitized, but I don't have a platform for that yet because we're still working on our digital asset management. But you can see here, this is from an expedition to Belgian Congo. And these are available on Biodiversity Heritage Library, but also on um, Internet Archive. Um, this week, I put up four journals from the second expedition to China and Tibet. That was Brooke Dolan's expedition. Um, and uh, from 1934 to 1935. So of the 300 or so field journals that I know for sure that we have, I've done about 45. <laughs> Again, a long way to go 
Um, but this has kind of been a priority, uh, really useful to our scientists um, and, and hopefully to others. So I have sort of talked your ear off a little bit, um, but uh, I'm happy to take questions. I can talk also a little bit about my background and how I got here. Uh, I guess I can start with that. Um, so my background is in history and museum studies. And uh, I, uh, so I had an undergrad in history, creative writing. My graduate degree is in history with a certification in museum studies. And when I graduated, uh, I got an internship, a sort of postgraduate school internship at the Jewish Museum of Maryland in, um, in Baltimore. And I was curatorial assistant there. So I started to learn about exhibition development. Uh, but while I was in grad school, I actually worked in the archives. So I was trained in um, archival theory and processing of collections. And while I was at the Jewish Museum of Maryland, I, uh, the archivist, that then archivist who I had been assisting, he left and I took over <laughs> and I have sort of never looked back. So all of my archives work has been in museums. I went from the Jewish Museum of Maryland to, I did a very short stint um, at the University uh, of um, the Library of um, Loyola Notre Dame in Baltimore, um, and then came here. And I've been here for eight years doing archives. So, not sure. Wow, I know some of the students are really drooling over the, the archives work there. Let's see, the questions or ideas from people? Hi, um, yeah, that all good stuff. I'm just curious when you mentioned that you tried to, or you need to let um, others know, or the world know that you have these collections, how do you? <laughs> that is a good question. So we, so, okay. So this is a long story. When I started eight years ago, I was hired and they said, by the way, we're gonna be closing soon for a renovation. So we're like, okay, three months, we're gonna close for a renovation. And so I was like, well, the first, you know, one of the things that I really wanna do is outreach and let people know. Um, and that proceeded to be five years of, in three months we're closing for renovation and three months we're closing for renovation. So we put off a formal outreach for um, longer than I would have liked. We did the renovation. We were about a month out from opening and then COVID hit. <laughs> so it's been a long struggle, but um, one of there's kind of two ways to, to go about doing this and that, that we're looking at. So one of them is um, a uh, connecting with the academic world. So that is working with say Drexel students. Um, I've been working with Lloyd Ackert in particular He's been having several cycles of co-ops who are doing research in the archives of Drexel. Uh, we've also had some classes come in and not just history, but also English and science. Uh, the, one of our curators of botany has brought his class in a couple of times to look at our collections. Um, and that's definitely something that we wanna look at doing. That's sort of almost like one-on-one -on -one kind of connecting with professors, letting students know that we've got that. But, we have the larger world as well. Um, and so some of that is can be accomplished through the fact that our database is online and a Google search will now lead you to our collections. Another way to do it is actually through some of our own um, uh, academic materials. Um, and that's definitely something that we're looking into. Right now it's social media and, and blogs, but there's always the potential to to write more um, about what we have, produce more. Um, and then we, so we sort of have dual audiences because we are a museum as well. So, you know, I want what I jokingly call to as, as say is like butts in the seats. I want people to come in and look at our materials and study our materials and request our materials. Um, but we also have a public museum and we want people there to know what we have. So we've been doing programming um, and we're hoping to increase that um, over the next couple of months, um, connecting with our uh, visitor services and also our exhibits team 
uh, Kelsey is actually going to be starting. Uh, so this uh, month, Kelsey and I are going to be doing programming that's directly related to our exhibits. Kelsey's starting next week, and then I'm starting the week after that. Um, so it's kind of, sometimes it feels a little like uh, being pulled in a couple different directions, but um, there's a lot that we can do. And we're sort of, because we've been so weird for three years plus, um, we're still finding our way a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, they, that all makes sense. <laughs> and actually, our scientists too are a good way because if I, you know, digitize their field journals and then they can go and talk it up to their buddies, and then all of the the other scientists can know what we have so that they can come look at it. Mm. Good old networking. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> other ideas or questions? Um. I don't know if this is a question or just a thought, but I'm just gonna say um, a couple of years ago, I worked, I usually work with like youth groups in Philly. I mostly work in libraries, but sometimes not. Um, and I worked on this program called the Bloomberg Arts Internship. Mm -hmm. um, and we had teens that were working at ANS and also at um, the zoo and they, um, at the Philadelphia Zoo. And they did like this joint project where they kind of talked about the relationship between the two and how like you didn't have zoos before because the only way you would see animals is if they were dead and in a museum until people started like keeping <laughs> live animals at the zoo. So like they were just talking about that relationship, but I wonder if that's an opportunity for outreach or if that's something that's on your radar. Yeah, uh, so we love collaboration and to we definitely wanna do more collaboration with more places. Uh, the zoo, the, the number of people that have worked at the zoo and now work at ANS or vice versa um, and the number of collections that we have. Uh, I know at least some of those mammal specimens in our collection came from the zoo because when a zoo animal dies, what are you gonna do with it? You put it at the academy. Yeah, and actually, you know, mentioning students, um, we haven't had as much opportunity in our department before, but we have this program called WINS, Women in Natural Sciences, which has been around for four years, that focuses on high school uh, girls in Philadelphia. And so I've been talking with them about bringing more students in to maybe do internships, because they work at the academy. They'll work in the collections, they'll work on our floor doing education. Um, and there's also some other programs um, that are looking for uh, uh, some like service hours or or that sort of thing and to bring students in. I love, love exposing students to primary sources. Um, at the Jewish Museum of Maryland, uh, Maryland was doing this entire program where it was helping teachers in elementary school learn how to use primary sources in the classroom. And that went all the way down to first grade. And I'm like first through 12th grade and college. And I want students of all ages to know this is not a scary place. This is not inaccessible. This is all for you. And you can come in and learn and you can, it's not just about reading a book that somebody wrote about it. It's also about coming in and looking at the primary source materials yourself. So I could talk forever about that. <laughs> Uh, but yes, collaboration with other institutions is great. Um, and, and we definitely have done some of that in the past and are definitely looking forward to potentially doing more of that in the future. Other ideas? I, I have a question about funding. So you said that your position is endowed. Um, to what extent are you guys also supported by other sources? I mean, who would come in and use the archives? Would it be people who pay to go into the museum or, or how would um, kids and, and researchers and students and teachers use the resources? So we don't charge for the use of the archives. You have to pay to come in and see the museum, but you do not have to pay to come in to the archives. Um, our funding sources are varied uh, because we have obviously a lot of, of demands from buying library books to staffing and things like that. Um, I also, uh, or, or we also, in many cases have applied for grants um, and have been successful with some of those. Um, and that often leads to both us getting staffing, but also a lot of, at least the grants on the archive side 
have been focused on increasing accessibility to the collection. So a lot of that has been digitization as well as the discoverability. Um, so enhancing the, the finding aids. But um, basically anybody who wants to come in just calls us, lets us know, and they come in. And I, and I tell them, you don't need professional um, credentials. When I said somebody come, like, if you want to come in and look at something, you can for any reason, because you think it's cool, that's okay. Um, I always say, don't just email me and say, you want to look at something cool? Tell me, I'm really into mushrooms. I would like to look at the Deschwanitz's illustrations of mushrooms because I'm really interested in mushrooms. That's enough. Um, and um, we encourage people to do that. I wasn't joking when I said tattoo inspiration. <laughs> one of our, um, I don't think she works here anymore, but one of our former scientists came in once to look at, I think it was mostly rare books, but yeah. Oh, wow. I really didn't know that. That's exciting. So other ideas or questions? Mushroom tattoo. They are quite popular. Birds also. Um, I posted an illustration from a very well-known mm -hmm. ornithologist from the early 19th century. And the next thing I know, one of our former ornithologists had him and all of his friends posting their tattoo of that illustration <laughs> on Facebook. So it was very engaging. It's probably the most engagement I'd had on Facebook in a while. <laughs> Who, who knew that's not what I would have guessed would have been the, the topic that lit. Did you see Shahada said she was excited when you talked about stolen art and colonialism? Yeah, yeah. And, and that also ties back to what Paul was saying about classification is human, fallible, and constructed. Yeah. What are you I will say, um, so the academy, what you'll find in a lot of natural history museums, and this always confused me. I didn't understand it. I still don't understand it. Well, I do because colonialism, but a lot of natural history museums will have ethnographic and archeology span departments. We do not, we used to. So that means that we were collecting cultural items and we were also collecting human remains. Um, all of those, but two um, have been uh, transferred to other places. And that was done in the 1930s to 1960s. Um, so even though when you're walking through the museum now, you're not necessarily going to see this sort of um, digging up of materials from the West or from um, uh, Egypt, we were still part of that. Um, and that's a story that we do wanna talk more about, but also, you know, I think it can be hard for some of our scientists to think that I'm a scientist. What I do is pure and these specimens have nothing to do with colonialism, but it's because of colonialism that we were able to go into these areas. They weren't American colonies, say in Africa, but they were still colonies and we were getting permission to go there from the French or the Belgians or the English, not from the peoples who lived there. Um, but we were also relying on the people who lived there to help us find our specimens. So that's a story that we're kind of talking more and more about wanting to tell. Um, and that's why I'm kind of excited um, about, uh, about getting these journals up online because I think there's, oh, the two mummies. So we did have two mummies until recently. Those were officially transferred over to the um, Penn Museum. Um, <laughs> those those were interesting because they they, they got uh, left behind by accident when we transferred the rest of the collections and they were kind of lost for about 20 years and then they were discovered again in 1976. Um, what I have is actually two articulated skeletons that were used for study and we're trying to find out more details about those um, so that we can figure out um, what the, the best way to uh, to handle them, um, but we don't have a lot of information on how they were purchased and brought in. Um, so if you don't have in, if you don't have a this was ethically sourced, we have to kind of figure that out. Thank you so much. I, we could go on and on, but I, I just realized what time is it, so we, we need to get to Kelsey. So thank you so much, though. So exciting. Kelsey, who's actually in the building, which is also exciting. Yeah.
<laughs> um, yeah, I'll just really quickly kind of tell you a little bit about um, what I do. So I'm the special collections librarian. So um, while everything that Jennifer works with is essentially unpublished materials and manuscripts and things of that nature, everything that I work with is published. Um, so just a little bit of like a quick historical background about the Academy. So the Academy was founded in 1812. Um, when it was founded, it was basically just like a group of guys who wanted to get together and talk about the natural world. Um, there wasn't really any organization in Philadelphia at the time that specifically dealt with the natural sciences. There was um, the American Philosophical Society, but they were kind of a very like broad reach, broad ranging um, group. And they kind of were a little bit also a little bit more upper crust than our, our group. Um, and so they basically got together in the second floor of this apothecary and decided that they were gonna found um, the institution um, for the purposes of basically just talking natural sciences together um, without talking about anything else. Um, and when they started, they pretty much had like about seven books between them. And so part of the impetus for doing this also was at the time, there wasn't really a American natural, natural sciences field. Most of the identification of um, flora and fauna in the US was actually being done by institutions in Europe. And the guys who founded um, our museum were essentially like, well, we live here, kind of ironically, actually, I, they were like, well, we live here and we want to identify things, kind of ignoring the irony that like they aren't actually from here, that, that they um, very only recently came to the US and displaced the peoples who originally lived here and um, have their own way of classifying the world around them. Uh, and so, you know, eventually what happened was the, the library continued to grow and grow and grow. Um, we also, the institution uh, historically has been very like cash poor. Um, so we had a gentleman called William McClure sh show up who essentially bankrolled um, the, the academy and, and spent a lot, of, a lot of money to get us all of our books. So we're in that really interesting position of having tons and tons of, of published materials that you know, we're the only library in the US that might have something. Um, so, you know, we kind of have two collections is the way I look at it. We have our rare book collection, which is, you know, primarily um, like three quarters of that is pre 19th century, or sorry, pre 20th century. Um, and then the other half is our circulating collection. So that's things that we allow the scientists to check out and bring, they're supposed to only bring it back to their office, but I get the sneaking suspicion that they take things home a lot. Um, and so I kind of deal with essentially a lot of, a lot of different things. So I spend a lot of my time dealing with issues pertaining to the rare book collection. So I see my role as kind of a stewardship sort of thing. So both, you know, taking care of the physical materials um, and protecting them, but also on the other side of that, the stewardship of making sure that they serve their intended purpose, which is to provide information to people. Um, so a lot of that is handling research appointments. Um, we have, you know, like Jennifer mentioned, we have class groups that come in, you know, the academy does like summer camp every year and we do a little thing with them, which is really fun. Um, and in like Jennifer said, we're kind of branching a little bit more out into museum programming. And I think special collections libraries are usually in a kind of a tricky um, position of trying to kind of bridge the gap between kind of behind the scenes, but also having a presence on your institution's public facing side. Um, so that is, yeah, that's an area that we're kind of spending a lot of time trying to, to kind of figure out that puzzle. Um, and just a little bit about me. So I am more of a museum person, I would say, than a library person, although I've been doing this job longer than any of my previous jobs. So I guess now I'm technically really more of a library person. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in anthropology um, I was really interested in paleoanthropology, so um, early hominids and things like that, um, until I realized the uh, grueling amount of field work that uh, that entails, and I was like, that's not for me. Um, and so I decided I wanted to go um, into museum work. So I did an internship at the museum in Reno, where I was going to school, and then when I moved back to Las Vegas to finish my undergrad, 
Um, I worked at a museum called the Mob Museum, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a museum about organized crime uh, in the US, um, which is not my favorite topic, um, which is also a, a kind of, you know, you don't need to necessarily, if you're looking to go into special collections, libraries, or museums, you don't have to kind of like pigeonhole yourself to an area that you're super, super interested in. It helps, but um, you don't necessarily have to have the interest for it to work. Um, but then when I moved to Philadelphia, I got the opportunity to come and work here as a library assistant. Um, and I was already kind of interested in the natural world and, you know, cultural, the cultural world. Um, and this was a really good kind of way to both embrace the, you know, museum collection side, which was really what I was interested in, um, but also be doing library work as well. And there's a lot of, um, I think, crossover in terms of skill set. Um, so it worked out really nicely. Um, and I like it here and I like all of our cool stuff that we have. I, you know, we're really short on time. So I don't, I'm not going to try and take up too much of your time, but I wanted to show really quickly a couple pictures of, oh gosh. Oh, there we go. Um, so this is our rare book room. This is part of the new um, renovation that we just did that Jennifer talked about. So this space houses the majority of our rare book collection. It's really nice and climate controlled um, and it has compact shelving. So we can fit a lot of stuff in there. This is just another part um, that actually has some of Jennifer's stuff in it. So Jennifer has some objects in her collection and that chair um, is from Charles Darwin's house. And, and Jennifer will be very upset if I say, if I don't say that we don't know if Darwin sat in the chair or not, um, but it was from his house. Um, and this is our, oops, this is our reading room. So whenever we have research appointments, this is where we bring folks um, for that and do some of the programming. And just to kind of, I'm not gonna, I kind of repurposed this from another thing that I did, just to give you an idea of the kind of image or the kind of um, stuff you would see in some of the works in our collection. Our collection is highly illustrative um, because obviously we didn't have photography for a very long time to take pictures of specimens, so people drew them. Um, this is from a book on the insects of Suriname from a woman called Maria Siegel Marion, um, which I would love to spend more time on, but I think we're out of time now. Um, but I'm always happy um, if you're ever curious about some of the stuff that we have um or would love to just stop by and see some of the stuff please 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 send us an email we are always happy to accommodate sorry i just want to show some we talked about mushrooms and now i want to show my mushroom pictures that are in here sorry i'm like flying through all these images um this is my favorite book in the collection it's illustrations of british mycology by this woman called anna maria hussey um and she was really really good at drawing mushrooms um, this is my favorite um, picture from the book so if you if the idea of a mushroom tattoo has intrigued you we have plenty of mushroom illustrations um, for your tattoo needs. All right, and I'm, if, you know, we have a couple minutes, if people don't mind, just a couple more minutes, I can answer any questions you might have. We're actually good for time class runs for another two hours. It's just a oh, question okay. if, you, if you need to leave, if you don't need to leave, then, then we're here. Um, um, do you have time yeah. to take questions or I don't know. Yeah, if I can take a couple clothes around you. Or are you going to be locked? I can take there? A, yeah, I can okay. take a couple questions. Okay. Questions anyone about anything other than tattoos? I had a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, Kelsey, you were saying a little bit about like the bridge between like library science and museum studies. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopefully good. Oh, I am already registered for classes next semester in the museum studies. And I'm really excited. I come from a painting background. So like museums and like reference libraries within museums are kind of the reason why I'm in this degree. So I kind of wanted to know like your understanding of like those two words colliding and like where they overlap. And then I was also curious, did you get, um, did you go to school for grad for library science or museum studies? I, I did, yeah, I forgot, to, I forgot to mention the part. I got my um, do my master's degree in museum studies uh, three years ago from Johns Hopkins. Um, they have a really fun um, grad program that I did fully online, which was nice because I was still working here while I did it. Um, but yeah, in terms of kind of bridging the world of like libraries and museums, I think, you know, in my experience as a museum goer, um, and I've always, you know, obviously been someone who's really, really into museums like since I was a kid. And I feel like there are a lot of places where you go and you'll kind of museums where you'll see that there's a library there, but it's very like closed off. And unfortunately, that's kind of like where we fall into too, right? So if you come to the museum and you go in this brand new gallery, there's just a glass wall that says like library and archives. And it's like very uninviting. And like in terms of, you know, 
there were very small staff. So it's just myself, another li um, our cataloging and serials librarian, and then Jennifer. So we're kind of like stretched really thin in terms of time. Um, so like we, and I, I, I think this is probably the case for a lot of special collections libraries and museums, like being having people be able to just like visitors be able to just stop by and like check things out is, is usually not really an option for a myriad of reasons unrelated to staffing. Um, but I think, you know, from my perspective of our institution, the way that I look at it is, is our library um, and our archives is a really, really, I mean, especially because of our age, and I feel like maybe I'm, I'm shooting the horn of our institution too much, um, a, a very unique view into the development of natural sciences, the natural sciences as a field. Um, and and in, in addition to that, and the thing that I that that draws me to our collection, um, besides the fact that I work here, um, is that you know there's so many stories um, held within these books. You know, I I'm of the view that you know a book is never just you know a book or the information contained in the text of the book or the illustrations in the book. You know, there's there are these just wild wild stories attached um, to some of these, and I think that there's a lot. Of that that's relatable um but it's a question of trying to how do i put this book in front of a visitor and get them to get past the idea that, that okay like i'm just looking at this this is just a book like why am i looking at this like it doesn't i think it doesn't click as quickly for people as if you're looking at a museum display and there's objects in there so like i think part of for me anyway bridging that gap is kind of trying to have that face-to-face -face interaction. So, which is kind of like a lot of librarians, I think get into it, like special collections librarians particular, like not like there's not really this huge idea of the, that, that type of face-to-face -face contact with people, right? Outside of a, a, of a strictly research scholarly sense. Like, so, you know, where we're kind of at with that is Jennifer kind of mentioned this new program that we're doing with our new exhibit. Um, essentially, I'm trying to think of like the elevator pitch version of trying to explain what this is. Essentially, you know, the new exhibit is called Invisible World of Water, and it's about um, diatoms, which are tiny, tiny, tiny little organisms that live in water um, that supply a lot of the world's oxygen. Um, they tell us a lot about the health of water systems that we don't really know very much. Like generally the public doesn't know very much about them. It's also about um, snow crystals. And so our part of that is kind of opening up the doors, inviting people in um, and putting out additional materials that provide greater context to what they're seeing in the exhibit. So for my part, um, I have a lot of materials that can actually show how did the study of diatoms develop as a field. So I have the, I have the um, Transactions of the Royal Society, which is this really, really old natural history um, society's publication um, that has been uh, running since like the late 1600s, I want to say. We have um, the issue from 1705 that has the first description and illustration of a diatom in it, which was like way before anyone knew what a diatom was. Um, it was just as the microscope was starting to become a, a pretty popular instrument um, and people were just people who had access to them would just look under the microscope and draw whatever they, they saw. So no, they didn't know what it was, but they drew it and they wrote in and said they found this thing. Um, and a, a couple other materials kind of relating to the development of that field, our own association with it um, and telling those stories and trying. I think for me, the big thing is I'm really interested in stories and processes, processes. So like trying to give people something that they can form some sort of connection with. So for example, one of the books that I pull out is by this guy, um, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, who invented a really important microscope that its predecessor had a magnification power, I think of like five times, and or no, sorry, his the, the predecessor had a magnification about 20 times, his had a magnification about 200 times. Um, and so von Leeuwenhoek wasn't a scientist. He had no formal education. Um, he grew up um, just being the assistant in like a draper shop and then eventually opened his own shop. Um, but trying to, to give people something to connect to, which was like, you know, we talk about citizen science a lot in the academy. And I think people think of it as like this kind of new thing, but it's actually not. Citizen science is actually like where science started. There is no, no like science, any scientific field without some form of citizen science. So like trying to show people 
you know, like you don't have to be, I think, a professional scientist to go out in nature and kind of have that connection with studying nature and, um, uh, you know, I, yeah. So for me, the big thing is like bridging that gap between special collections libraries and, and museums is trying to make a personal, like a connection with the visitor. Um, collaboration with the curators. Um, so I would say, um, I mean, most of our collaboration, I would say comes more in the form of like them coming to do research. So like Jennifer said, like our biggest researchers are the scientists. Um, but we are, I think now that we're kind of trying to kind of come out from behind the scenes and have more of a presence in the museum proper, I think that there's a lot more room for collaboration. So um, I spend a lot of time talking with um, the curator of the, the, the department that works with diatoms, who's like, she's like the most important diatomist in the world. Diatomist, I don't know if I'm saying it right. Um, and kind of having her educate me on what the history of the, the field is and kind of helping me figure out, okay, what are the materials I can pull to tell this story? Um, and I think the other most important thing is making it in collaborating with them is just making sure that when we um, speak about our materials and like put them out that we're not saying anything in error scientifically. Because, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're librarians. So like, I'm, you know, I'm very, very knowledgeable about, you know, printed materials. But if someone asks, like points at something in a book and asks me to describe like, what is this like butterfly or something that I'm looking at, I'm going to have to be like, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I can't be there. I don't know. But I will actually jump on that really quick um, in terms of like collaborating with our, our curators and our scientists. You know, all the scientists, all the collections managers and us, we're, we're data people. That's that's what we do. <laughs> and um, we are and have been doing a lot. Um, so our our collections managers and curators are trying to get their databases more cohesive. And then we're also trying to get like our databases linked into there. And then as we're trying to initiate DAMS, digital asset management systems, we're looking at, it's not just about me being able to preserve digital materials, it's about all of us. And so I think that is one of those things where we have a lot of crossover um, as well is on the, the data side. How, how are we all creating data and organizing data and giving access to data. And, you know, it might be that ichthyology has dead fish in a jar and, you know, Kelsey has a rare book, but how do we get maybe the rare book that has a description of that dead fish in a jar and connecting all of those together? Yeah. And I think the other thing, and one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in want to spend a lot more time in is, like I said, I'm really interested in process. And so, I'm really interested in kind of highlighting, you know, before science was professionalized, you know, and these people were mostly amateurs, how do you, you know, you get this idea if that a scientist needs all this highly specialized equipment in order to, to do their jobs. And looking at, you know, some of the scientific works that we have, I find that that's not always the case. Um, and typically, and so like, I really like trying to highlight, you know, how have these processes changed you know, what will we do differently now? There's something I really want to do with one of the books that I show in this kind of behind the scenes experience is a book from the mid 19th century that because there was no way to learn how to collect and mount diatoms, there would be these very small like handbooks that would be published that would say, you know, okay, like here's how you collect them. Here's how you um, mount them. Here's how you display them. And here's how you build your own herbarium. And so I really, what I really want to do is kind of try out some of the stuff that's described in these books and see like, okay, do these like methods, if you're just like a normal person trying to do this, like, is it easy and does it actually hold up? Um, and how does that differ from the way that our scientists do that work now? Um, hopefully that's something I can do in the future um, when I have a little bit more time. I also just thought Mackenzie's, um, uh, no, we do not all have the same collections management systems and that's the problem. <laughs> um, and, um, one of the things that I've learned too is that uh, some departments, uh, you know, you have entomology departments, some of them actually have multiple collections management systems because they get money for a grant and then they put that into like a separate database for that project because it's part of a project with other institutions. Anyway, it's a little bit of a mess. You can still find stuff, 
but it's definitely a crazy thing um, to, to deal with. And of course, archives and libraries, the way that we deal with stuff is totally different than how scientists do. And then I have objects. Yeah. <laughs> objects are not processed the same way and cataloged the same way as um, archives. Um, oddly, before I got here, they were. Um, but, you know, Kelsey and I have this sort of museum studies background, so we can look at our stuff as objects and um, in, um, in, in different ways. Um, we've both done book boxes and um, that sort of more like you think of like collections management and conservation kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, no, I don't know how many different collections management systems they are. Some of them are the same tight it, the, some of them are all like file maker database but there's like 10 of them and some of them are the scientists all have like symbiota and i dig bio and specify and all kinds of stuff and then i have archive space and access and then kelsey has <laughs> no oh yeah uh, so yeah mine is so mine i don't really use a collection management system um i use um a live like library management system so we just actually use what drexel libraries uses so if you're ever looking for something that's in the academy library literally you can just go to like the drexel libraries homepage and search and you will find things that are in the academy um so i'm lucky in that way that like drexel libraries handles that um and i don't have to worry about it <laughs> I mean, we do have to worry about it because we put things into like our cataloging librarian, she puts things into that system, but like in terms of like the maintenance of that system, we don't really have to worry about it, which is nice for us. All right, I know we're over time. Thank you guys so much. We could keep talking for hours. Um, hopefully, some of us will be in to see you guys. You're open now. It's been a while since I've been to the library. I've never been to the archives. I've been to the library a couple of times and also been to talks when they used to do the Audubon books and they turn the page. <sighs> Good times. Yeah, that was us. That was, yeah. And then part of do, doing this thing with the exhibit is actually us trying to have that kind of ritualistic type presence again. So um, please, yeah, I highly encourage anyone who wants to come and visit, just like send us an email. Um, I'm sure um, Denise can can um, distribute our emails. If Oh, yeah, if you don't mind, that'd be great. Yeah, no, I don't mind at all. Please, like I said, I cannot say enough how much if you want to come and see some stuff, just drop us a line. We're always more than happy to show off the collection. So please do. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so Thank exciting. You. Thank you. Great. Right. Enjoy the rest of your class. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. So, um, just yeah, this was fantastic. All right. So, um, everyone in class, take a twenty-minute break. We'll come back and we'll talk more about being so inspired. So, seven thirty-five. <laughs>